Hey, listen, if you have your copy of the Scriptures, and I'm sure you do, if you'll take and turn in the Old Testament to the very first book of the Bible. Young people, what is the name of that book? Genesis. Genesis. That's right. We're going to turn to Genesis this morning. So if you'll just find Genesis chapter 12. And while you're turning there, let me ask you, when I make this statement that I'm about to make, what name comes to your mind? Now, some of these young people are going to have any clue. But when I say something like, and now for the rest of the story, <laughs> whose name comes to mind? Oh, Paul Harvey, right? Who? And you're probably thinking, who in the world is Paul Harvey, right? Well, he passed away in 2009, but I want to tell you what. Paul Harvey was a famous radio personality. Man, I loved listening to Paul Harvey. He was a news commentator, young people, and he was a, a, a news columnist, but he had a special knack, didn't he, for bringing the news in story form. And, and really, as a columnist, writing tremendous stories and just... This guy had a lot of wisdom, but you know, he also had a lot of good old common sense. Amen? And I'm going to tell you what, if our world doesn't need common sense today, I don't know what it needs. We need people more like Paul Harvey. And so one day, Paul was, in, in one of his writings, he was talking about the children of some famous people and how difficult it was to be a child of a famous person because he said, you know, that child is never really himself. He's, he's known as the son or the daughter of so-and-so, right? And, and in doing that, Paul Harvey said these words. Let me open my sermon to it, if I can find it, if you'll turn it straight. Paul said this. Come on, there you go. Paul said this, and I quote. He said, my son has given me a gift more precious than any. He has given up his identity for me. He went on to say that his son was often referred to, oh, that's the son of Paul Harvey, right? And then he said it like this, the children of the famous are never themselves anybody. They seem destined to be a pronoun and never a noun. Now, I hope some of you understand what I'm saying there. Right Now listen, English teachers and students, we know that a noun, right, is a central idea or thought of a sentence. And we also know that a pronoun is a word that refers to or is used in place of a noun or a name. And so when they refer to Paul Harvey as his son, as the son of Paul Harvey, the son is a pronoun, right? Now, now listen, you may get the idea that a pronoun is less important than a noun. But, you know, that's not true. It just has different functions. So does an adjective and an adverb and all of this, right? But do you realize that this is also true about the New Testament church? Now, how in the world is it true of the church? Well, no matter your spiritual giftedness, as I look out among you today, you're different, unique people. God has made you special, unique and he has gifted each one of you in a special way. Some of you have some very tremendous gifts. You're multi-talented. Others of us, well, we just have a simple gift of service or whatever it might be. And so no matter your giftedness, whether you're one of those high-profile Christians that we might refer to as a noun, or maybe you're one of those low-profile Christians that we might call a pronoun, I want you to know this. You are of equal value to the church. You are important. God has created you unique, and He has a plan for your life in this church. So as a church, we must be careful in being not to be caught up in what we call the star complex, right? That's the world's practice of recognizing the specially gifted and talented, or we might call them the elite in the world, right? All the while disregarding the the average or the normal or the regular person. We need high-profile Christians. There's no doubt about that. We need those multi-talented individuals. We need those, those nouns, those, those people that hold those positions. We need that. But we also need the low-profile Christians, the unrecognized, the maybe the unknown, the behind-the-scenes or what 
I'm going to refer to as the pronouns because they make their own contribution to God's work. And do you realize this? There are far more pronouns in any given local body than there are nouns. You think about it. It, it is the pronouns that make the church work. Sometimes I think about us preachers, you know, and I used to tell everybody preachers are nothing but a bunch of seconds. You know, if you take all the people who, who are really gifted and talented, most of them don't have any time for God. So he said, I'll take the simple things to confound the wise. So we're just simple things. But we, we do hold, maybe hold a position of a noun in a church, and those positions are needed. But listen, if it wasn't for the pronouns, the church could not be the body of Christ on planet Earth. So I want you to know you make your own contribution to God's work. So our message from God's Word today is going to both exemplify and teach us this truth. So now that you found the book of Genesis and, and chapter 12, I want to show you an Old Testament example of this truth, and then we're going to follow that up in a little bit with some New Testament examples or teachings of that truth, you might say. Now, I've asked you to turn to Genesis chapter 12. Let's do a little biblical history. Let's do, what do you say, 2,000 years of biblical history real quick. Can we do that? We know that in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, chapters 1 and chapter 2, we have the story of creation where God created the heavens and the earth. He created the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and the, and, and the beasts of the field. And that on the sixth day, God took a mound of dirt and shaped it in something that must look like a human and breathed life into it. It became a living soul. And we know that we have Adam. And then he took from Adam a bone and made Eve. And we had the first couple and they were living in perfect harmony in a perfect world. But we know in Genesis chapter 3, something happened. Sin entered the world. Adam and Eve fell into sin. They disobeyed God. And as a result of that, the nature of sin was inbred into the human race. And when Adam and Eve had children, their first two sons, Cain and Abel, Cain rose up and killed Abel because of the nature of sin. And then from that point on, from, from chapter 4 where he rose up and killed his brother to chapter 6, which actually covers, folks, about a 1,000 to 1,500-year period, wherever you want to date Noah. Because by the time of Noah, the, the, the sinfulness of the human race had progressed so much that there was no one left on earth other than Noah and his family that was even righteous. And God took a man by the name of Noah, told him to build a big boat and take two of all the animals and take his sons and his wife and their wives into the boat, and he was to cause a big flood to fall upon the earth. And that happened, and he killed everything alive except that which was on the boat, and God started over. And with those children of, of, of Noah and his wife, um, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, if you'll follow in chapters 8, 9, and 10 through there, you're going to see the genealogy of these two guys or these three brothers as, as they had children, they had children, they had children, they had children. And if you follow the line of Shem, you'll see about ten generations down, Shem it, it brings into the, the world a great, 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 great grandson named Abram. And his story is found for us in Genesis chapter 12. Are you with me now? You know where we're at? Okay, Genesis 12. This is referred to as the call of Abraham. Those of you who are familiar with this story, I just want to remind you of it and read it once again. In, in chapter 12 and verse 1, this is where God gets the attention of Abraham. Now, he was called Abram in the beginning. He was married. He had a wife. Her name was Sarai, who later was referred to as Sarah. Abraham, at the time of this passage in chapter 12, is 75 years old. He's not a young man, but he's 75 years old. His beautiful wife, Sarah, is about 10 years younger. She's about 65 years old. But I want you to know that Abraham was, must have been a strong man of faith, a man that loved God. He was monotheistic, and he believed in the one true God. And for whatever reason, he was the man that God chose to do a tremendous work through. And it's found here in chapter 12, verse 1. And so it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, remember his name was Abram at first, the Lord has said to Abram, get out of your country and from your family and from your father's house and go to a land that I'm going to show you. Now he's saying, Abraham, I want you to pack up your bags. I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your homeland. And I'm going to send you to a new land, right? To a land that I will show you. And in verse 2 he says, 
and I will make you a great nation. Now, you need to know that Abraham and Sarah right now, at 75 and 65 years old, that Sarah was barren and she never had any children. She was unable to have children, right? And here he says, I'm going to make you a great nation. Now, wait a minute. For him to make Abraham a great nation, something had to happen. He had to have a, 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 a child in some way or another. He says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. Now, watch this. And in you, talking about Abraham, in you, in your descendants, the people that's going to come from you, in you, all the families of earth shall be blessed. He didn't say that some of the families of earth. He didn't just say the special people I'm going to bring up. He says all the families of earth shall be blessed. What is he talking about? He's talking about the blessing of salvation. Now listen carefully. God spoke to Abraham, and he called him to go on upon a grand adventure. He really did. To a place that he had never seen before for a purpose that was going to be glorious. That one day, through the seed of Abraham, even though they had no children at the time, one day through the seed of Abraham, a great nation would come. Now, here's the important part. And out of that great nation, one day, the divine deliverer would come. We sang about him a while ago, didn't we? Jesus, the Messiah. One day through the seed of Abraham, the Messiah is going to come, and he's going to bring the blessings of salvation to all nations of the earth. Well, we know that Abraham was obedient in that call. When he realized that God wanted him to leave his homeland and all of that, he packed his bags, he took his wife, he took his servants, he took his nephew, he took all of his, his cattle and sheep and whatever he had, he took everything and he began that journey. Now you have to understand if you know anything about the geography of the Middle East and especially of the land of Israel and that, Abraham lived in, 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 the, in the province of Ur, which is at, right at the head of the present-day Persian Gulf. And so for him to leave the Persian Gulf and come all the way over here to the promised land, he had quite a journey because between where he was at and the promised land was nothing but desert. And so as he made that journey, the first 600 miles, he would have walked steadily uphill right alongside the Euphrates and Tigris River all the way up to the, the town of Haven, or the village of Haven, which was the place of his father's birth. And from there, after a 600-mile journey, he then would have had to turn in a, in a southwesterly direction and come down through the Lebanon and the anti-Lebanon mountains right beneath the snow-capped mountain of Mount Hermon. And he would eventually would have made his way right into a beautiful strip of land called the Promised Land. No more than 45 to 65 miles wide at any given point. Biblical boundaries, 150 miles from north to south. So you might say it like this. Let's look at this aisle way for a moment. Let's just say that this aisle is that long strip of land. Over here was the desert. He left around the Persian Gulf, went 600 miles, and come down into the Promised Land. Now over here on the western side is nothing but the Mediterranean Sea. So you have the sea on one side, you have the desert on the other side, and what you have in between is what the Bible referred to as a land bridge. You see, it connected any part of the country in the north, where Russia is at today, all the way down to Ethiopia and Africa in the south, anybody wanting to travel from the north to the south or the south to the north, the logical place for them to go was through this one strip of land. It was difficult to cross the desert. You could do it, but it wasn't easy. It was difficult to cross the water. They did have some sailboats, you might say, at that day and time. It was difficult. It could be done. But the easy way was to go through this land bridge, a beautiful land the Bible says is flowing with milk and honey. It was in this land that Abraham made his journey. But even once he got there, there were hostile tribes people living in that, in that land. And they sought to destroy Abraham. They did everything they could. But through it all, God delivered him. Yet the years that Abraham spent there soon turned into decades. In fact, 25 years went by. He's now 100 years old, and Sarah's 90 years old, and still they have not had a son, right? And then one day as Abraham is sitting outside his tent, Scripture says he looks off in the distance, and he sees some visitors coming his way. In fact, they were called strange heavenly visitors. In fact, it was the angel of the Lord himself. And they came to the tents of Abraham and said, Abraham, about this time next year, you and Sarah are going to have a son. And remember what it said? Sarah overheard that in the tent, and she began to laugh. 
And I want to tell you something. That little child that she held in her arm one year later, she named Isaac because Isaac means laughter. I don't know about you, but I bet you old Abraham was a proud father, right? Man, he'd wait a long time for his own son. I could just see him walking around like a, like a rooster crowing, seeing that son of his running here and running there. Maybe little Isaac would pick up a, a rock and throw at some of the desert birds that flocked so near. Maybe it was a mad race to catch one of the wild goats that would come through there. And Abraham would just kind of sit there and watch that son of his dashing here, dashing there, and he'd be thinking something like this. Man, God is good. One day through that lad, one day the promised one's going to come. To God be the glory. Well, Abraham watched as that son grew, and, and he grew into a young man. And then something strange happens. Turn with me to Genesis 22. Just a few chapters over. Genesis chapter 22. God speaks to Abraham. Now, this isn't the first time that Abraham had heard God's voice. The first time he had heard God's audible voice, right? was back in chapter 12. And, and from chapter 12 to chapter 22, there were times when God spoke audibly to Abraham, told him to build an altar here, make a sacrifice here. This is not the first time that Abraham's about to hear the voice of God. And so in the midst of all of this, he's excited about that son that one day the Messiah is going to come through. He's all excited. And all of a sudden in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, it says this. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. Underline that word tested if you mark in your Bible. Sometimes God will test his people. It says that he tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Now watch this, take now your son, which was Isaac, right? Take now your son. Your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains that I will tell thee of. Now put yourself in Abraham's place for a moment. Here was a man of faith. Here was a man who was always obedient to God, was willing to do anything and everything God called him to do. Now all of a sudden, he caused him to take that only son that God had given to him as a miracle to begin with and who had promised that the Messiah would one day come through him. And he says, now I want you to take and offer that son as a burnt offering. Do you think Abraham may have thought he was losing his mind? You think maybe some of the pagan practices of human sacrifice, which was practiced in those days and time in, in some of those areas where he was at, do you think maybe some of that was starting to rub off on him? Abraham must have struggled to try and determine, God, is this really what you want me to do? I don't, I don't know what happened. The Bible doesn't say. It just simply says this, that Abraham, in verse 3, rose early in the morning. And he saddled his donkey and took with him two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him, Moriah, Mount Moriah. That last night, very likely they would have pitched their tent right beside a brook that would one day be called Brook Kedron. And the place where they lay their blankets would one day stand a garden of olive trees that would be called the Garden of Gethsemane. And after one long, agonizing night, it says that Abraham arose and he took his young son and the two of them went up the mountain. Let's look at it. Verse 4. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes. He saw the place afar off. And Abraham, Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and now watch this, and we will come back to you. You see the faith of Abraham? We're coming back. So Abraham took the wood, and well, verse 6 is a beautiful verse, he, or uh, paints a beautiful picture. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering 
and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. Now, now let's listen for a moment. When it says he took the fire in his hand, they would use a bronze bucket, and they would have coals of fire that they would bring with them to go wherever they would build the altar at and make the sacrifice. So here's the picture. You have an old gray-haired father and his son, and they're on the way up the mountain together to build an altar to worship God. And so here's the old gray-haired father. He's got the bucket of coals in his hand. The knife is stuck in his belt. He's got little Isaac, and the wood is on little Isaac's back, and the two of them are going up that mountain. Now, I don't think Isaac was very slow of wit. I think he's probably a pretty sharp young man. Because in verse 7, it says that Isaac said to his son, to his father, he said, Abram, but Isaac spoke to Abram, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Many times in Isaac's life, however old he was at this time, he had been with his father to build an altar to God. A simple altar, they would slide these rocks into a, a circle and they would put the wood on it and they would offer the animal and they would just sit there or kneel there with prayers, watching their prayers ascend with the smoke up in the heavens. So many times Isaac had built altars with his father. But something's missing. There, you know, there's the wood, there's the fire, there's a knife, and then there's little Isaac. I often wondered if Isaac didn't realize what was about to happen. If he did, I know that he, he, he would have trusted his father and his father's God. It just simply says the two of them made their way up that mountain. And in verse 8, Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. Once again, you see the faith of Abraham. So the two of them went together. But then look at verse 9. Then they came to the place which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and then he bound his son Isaac and laid him upon the altar. He would take the leather straps and bind. I wonder if little Isaac just didn't do this for his daddy. I think it's possible. I think maybe he was a willing sacrifice because he trusted his father. And he trusted his father's God. I don't know. Speculation. But I do know this. It says that Abraham bound his son Isaac and put him on the altar. And in verse 10 it says, And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him out of heaven and said, Abram, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand upon the lad, for now I know or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes, and he looked, and behind him there was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering upon the altar instead of his son. So can you imagine, all of a sudden, he lifts his eyes up, he sees that ram, he cuts little Isaac loose, the two of them go and they grab that ram, and, and they do whatever they got to do, and they sacrifice it on the altar. Listen, I can see, I can see if I can get down like this, give me a second. <laughs> I can see old Abraham and that little boy kneeling beside that altar. I can see tears streaming down that old father's face, maybe stand glistening in his old white beard. And Abraham's probably thinking something like this. God is good. And his ways are beyond understanding. And then I look at little, hey, little Isaac. Like he's probably thinking, wow, that could have been me. <laughs> in fact, it almost was me, right? But listen, if you look right over the shoulder of old Abraham for a moment, and you look 2,000 years in the future, you're going to see another broken-hearted father walk up a mountain, watch his only son walk up a mountain with a load of wood on his back. 
and that wood was shaped like an old rugged cross. And brothers and sisters, there was no ram to take his place. He had to die in order that we might live. If you don't understand anything else, understand this. God never wanted the life of little Isaac. You know what he wanted? He wanted the heart of that father. That's what he wants from us. He wants our heart. And so here we have an interesting story with, with little Isaac, but, but from there, all you hear of Isaac after that is that he marries a woman by the name of Rebekah. They have two sons, two twin boys. They name him Jacob and Esau. And now listen, if the line is going to continue from Abraham to Isaac, and all of a sudden Isaac has two sons, God has to choose which line it's going to go down, right? And God chose Jacob. And Jacob, God later named or renamed Israel. And Israel, or Jacob, married and had 12 sons. And those 12 sons eventually become the 12 tribes of Israel. And over the next four or 500 years, those, that family became the great nation that God had promised old Abraham back in chapter 12. So what am I saying this? You have Abraham. Well, look, look at your outline for a minute. Who was Abraham? Well, the outline, he, he was a noun. That's who he was. He was a, a noun among God's people. He was a man of tremendous faith. And he became the father of the Hebrew nation. Can you feel those words then? Abraham was the first Hebrew. Abraham was the first Israelite. Abraham was the first Jew. Hebrew, Israelite, Jews, the same people. You're an American, you're a Texan, and you're an angel, Angelite, right? What do you call yourself here, Angelites, right? We're the same people. Abraham, I used to think my father-in-law was the first Jew, but I found out he, that's not true. <laughs> Abraham was the first Jew. That's a joke in case you missed that, you know. <laughs> but, but listen, he was the father, is what I want to show. He was the father of the Hebrew nation, that nation that one day was going to bring the Messiah into the world. So we know who Abraham was, but who really was Isaac? Well, Isaac, he was a pronoun among God's people. That's who he was. He was the son of a famous father, and he was a father of a famous son. And sandwiched in between was little Isaac. Isaac was a small link in a long chain. Now, the truth I want you to grasp from this is simply this. There is a place in the people of faith even for the last and the least. No matter how small your gift might be, your talent might be, there's a place in this body for you, and you are important. Far more pronouns than there are nouns among God's people. You never forget that. We need the Abrahams, we need the Jacobs, but we also need the Isaacs. Now, that truth that I share with you quickly I want to go to the New Testament and show you that that teaching continues through the New Testament. There's always a place for the last and the least. So let's look at a New Testament teaching. Turn with me to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. I think that's in the New Testament. Matthew 25. You got it? Verse 14. Here Jesus is going to illustrate such a truth in a parable. You see the outline? What is a parable? A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so Jesus is going to illustrate the truth that we just discovered in Abraham and Isaac in the form of a parable. So here in 20, Matthew 25, verse 14, listen to what it says. He gives a parable. Jesus is speaking. He says, For the kingdom of heaven is like, he's making a comparison, the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. Now listen, the master always knows his servants. 
He gave one five, one two, and one one according to their own ability, the way they had been gifted. And then he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. So here we're introduced to a man and three of his servants. The man is going to on a far journey for a long period of time. He entrusts his property to his servants, each one giving a certain amount according to their own ability. A talent, in this case, really was a sum of money. In fact, it was a fairly large sum of money. Later, the man's going to return and look for an accounting of his investment. So in verse 19, it says, after a long time. I could say a whole lot about this. You know, it's been a long time since Jesus came the first time. But brothers and sisters, don't you doubt for a moment he's coming again one day. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into your joy of, of your Lord. And then he who also had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents, and look, I've gained two more talents besides them. And the Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then came he who had received one talent and came and said, Lord, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take from the one uh, take from, from this one and give to him who has ten talents. For everyone who has, more will be given. And he who has an abundance from him, from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken. Let me just stop right there for a moment. The two talents, the five talent servant, they put their talent to work. They did something. In regard to the church, they did something. In the church, they both doubled their investments, and they both received the same commendation. But the one talent, he hid it. The talent he had, he did nothing with it, and he gave back to God what God had given him to begin with. Nothing else to show for it, and he received the condemnation. You wicked and lazy servant. What is the point of this parable? How to make good investments? No. Though I've heard it preached like that. No, it's how to make the most of the talents we have. Do you understand the five and the two and even the one servant, had he used his talent, he could have made equal contributions to the kingdom of God. Pronouns, use your gifts, use your talents. You make equal contributions to the kingdom of God. Jesus illustrated it in a parable. Paul captured it in the truth. I have no idea what time it is, so hang with me. I'll move quick. Paul captured it in, in, a, in a, uh, a picture in 1 Corinthians 12. In fact, I'm going to move through that real quick because we looked at this passage last or two weeks ago when I was here. It's about the body, how the body is one. Let me just read it real quick. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14. For in fact, the body is not one member but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not of the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Of course not. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Of course not. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as it pleased Him. 
And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again can the head say to the feet, I have no need of you. Now listen to verse 22. No much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. So here he presents the, the body as, as uh, the, the body of Christ as a human body. We need each other. Each body is made up of different parts. But you see, the same message is presented here that Jesus gave us in the parable. The same message that was illustrated in the life of Isaac. What is that message that's proclaimed? Verse 22, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Do you understand how important you are to God? Never put yourself down and say, well, oh, I'm just not very gifted. Oh, I'm not very much. I'm just, I'm just going to be an humble servant over here, and I'm just going to keep my little talents. In my... Don't do that. Don't do... Use what God has given you and serve. You may have the gift of encouragement, and the only thing you can do is make someone else feel better. Do it. You might, you might have the, the gift of, of service, whatever it might be. Use it. Serve wherever there's a need in the church. Do your part. Not only did Jesus illustrate in a parable and Paul captured it in a picture, but James depicted it in a truth and a warning, or this truth and a warning. James chapter 2, verse 1, and I'll move quick here as well. James begins in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, my brethren. He's speaking to the church. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a, in a, a, a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand over there. You sit here at my footstool. He says, Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my brethren, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do not they blaspheme? that noble name by which you are called, if, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin, and you're convicted by the law of transgression. This deals with how to treat people in the church. What is James saying here? Same message that was captured by Paul in a picture. Same message that was illustrated by Jesus in a parable. And the same message that was demonstrated in the life of Isaac. There's a place among God's people for the last and the least. And so the fact of the matter is this. I think I said this a couple weeks ago. The ground is level at the cross. Many years ago, I walked out of a restaurant. I think it was... Oh, Cracker Barrel, I think. Because when you walk out, there's always chairs. And I walked out, and there was some chairs somewhere. And there was an elderly guy sitting there, and I was waiting for someone, and I just stood there and, and began visiting with him for a little bit. And uh, he eventually handed me his card, his business card. And when I looked at it, it was blank on both sides. <laughs> and we, we just smiled and la had a good laugh about it, right? And then later on, I read about... Another man who had a business card uh, that said, I'm in charge of the little things. That's all it said. The person holding the card, I'm told, was, was not a very influential person. They were not a natural-born leader. In fact, said you might consider him one of the least and, last last and least important of people. Well, the good news is that for those two men and countless others like them, there's a place among God's people for the last and the least. So, if you feel like your lot in life is to be in charge of the little things, if you believe yourself to be a part of the army of the anonymous, the unknown, 
the unrecognized, the least. Would you go ahead and claim a wife Isaac as your patron saint? Isaac was not like his father Abraham, in which can be traced three world religions. Nor was he not like his son Jacob, who became the namesake for the nation of Israel in whom the 12 tribes came to existence through. No, he wasn't like that. Isaac was like Isaac. And he teaches us an important lesson. There's a place in God's kingdom for you and for me. So to all the pronouns here at Second Baptist Angleton, find your place of service. No matter how menial it may be, serve with joy. You're important and you are needed. And so there's a place among God's people for the last and the least. The church needs its Abrahams, but it also needs its Isaacs. And if the Abrahams and if the Isaacs come together and do their part, then remember this from two weeks ago, the best days of Second Baptist Angleton are what? Now, come on, we've got to do better than that. The best days of Second Angleton are what? Still in the future. Then you be an active part of that future. God has a plan. You're praying for that pastor. God's going to send you that pastor. He has a plan for this church. Believe it, accept it, and move forward with it. So as, brother, if you'll come and just play softly just for a minute as we enter into our time of invitation, let, let me just get personal with you just for a moment. And just with Gabe playing something softly just for a second, let me ask you a personal question. Has God spoke to you through this message? I sure hope he has. But let me ask you like this. Is God calling you maybe into service? As I'm speaking of this, deacons, if you just come on and come forward and stand up here before your church. If God is calling you into service, if you think maybe you're a pronoun and you've never really found your place and you still don't know exactly where it is, but you're willing to say, hey, I want to find a place to serve. If God has said that to you this morning, would you just come up here and take one of your brother deacons and say, brother, pray with me, because I don't want to hide my talent. I want to use whatever it is that God has given me for his glory. If that's you, would you just come just a moment? Maybe he's calling some of you not only to service, but he's just calling you to surrender a little bit more of your life. Maybe you're doing a few things. Maybe you're using some of the giftedness in your life, but you're not using all of it. You haven't fully surrendered to the Lord. Maybe God's calling some of us who are serving in little ways, and you know He's calling you to serve in a greater way. Would you come? Would you share with these brothers and deacons and just say, you know, I've given some and I've served some, but God's calling me to give more and serve more. Is that you? This invitation's for you. So maybe he calls some to service. Maybe he's called some to surrender. But maybe he's calling some to salvation. Maybe you're here today and you have a lot of knowledge about God. Been in Sunday school. You know some of the answers the teachers ask you. Maybe you're already a member of the church, but you know in your heart you've never fully accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You've never fully said, yes, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And yes, Lord, I understand that I can't save myself. And yes, Lord, I understand that your word says Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe. And there's a debt that I can't pay. And I know if I'll let him come in my life, he'll pay that debt for me. So I want to say yes to you, Lord, today. So if you find yourself here just wanting to reduce it to the lowest common denominator, Lord, I just want to say yes to you. I want you to be a part of my life. Is that you? You come too. You share with these brothers what God is calling you like. Don't don't leave today without having your needs met, your commitments made. God wants to do something special in your life. So I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet now. I know some have already come. Others need to come.